Amen. All right, check this out. So here they were, John. You ready for this? This absolutely horrible, horrible existence, right? Even worse than chicken, right? Can you imagine working on a chicken farm? That would be horrible. Let's just keep moving on. Anyway, that's right. We're, we'll get it rolling. A horrible, horrible existence that just seemed to tumble on forever and ever and ever, never ending, never slowing down. The same years and decades of torment and regret and sorrow and pain, blanketed darkness, lights, uh, nights, never ending, constant consciousness, lostness, aloneness, loneliness, rumblings from the pit, groans, torturing fire, choking smells, unending and unending, no letting up, no relief, no comfort, never resting, never ceasing, no end in sight. 100 years rolls into another 100 years, slowly turning over into a 1,000 years, painstakingly going into another 1,000 years. The same grinding pain, the continual bone-racking agony, the screams upon screams, the weeping upon weeping, the echoing sighs upon sighs. Is it ever going to end? All of a sudden, bang, just like that. They were out of there. It was gone. Could it be true? Could it, it, was it over? Were, yeah. The pain, the agony, the torture was all gone. And now they were standing before this huge, massive white throne with tons and tons of books all around them. And, and there before them, the people from all walks of life, both young and old alike, were lined up in these huge, massive, giant lines. And uh, it looked as if the whole history of humanity was represented here. And that's because it was. Suddenly, the joy was replaced by fear as each person took their individual place before the throne and and suddenly the purpose of the books was realized they contained every single dirty rotten thing these people had ever done no one left those books thinking they could ever get to heaven on their own no way they fell horribly short every last one of them they had rejected the work of the messiah and had instead trusted in their own works and lest there be any doubt a book that did contain all the names of those who were going to heaven who did trust the messiah was opened up and sure enough, these people's names who were standing before the throne, their names could not be found anywhere. And so it was these people got what they knew at that point they justly deserved. They were now cast into the lake of fire forever. The book is Revelation. The judgment, of course, is the great white throne judgment, the final judgment. That's really coming, folks. And, and as you can see, that, that, that's the, the time frame of what's going on there is these people, that existence, they've been in hell this whole time. From the moment that they died because of rejecting Christ as their Savior, they went straight to hell. But the Scripture tells us in Revelation, all of a sudden, they're going to get out of it. And they're going to be standing before the great white throne. But what's going to happen is then the courtroom scene, if you will, unfolds. And they go from the frying pan into the fire. You thought hell was bad? Now you're going to be chucked into the lake of fire. That's what the Bible says. Now, here's the point. I don't know about you, but I'd say rejecting the work of Jesus Christ on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins and instead trusting in your own works to try to get yourself to heaven is one of the worst mistakes you could ever make, right? Exactly, folks. That's what the scripture uh, teaches. This event that we just read, folks, the great white throne judgment really is coming to all humanity, okay? Now, again, here's the point. You would think then, you would think, it's recorded for us in the Bible, that people would stand up and take notice when God warns them about that coming future judgment, okay? And, and you think that they would rightly conclude, man, I better get right with God now so I don't end up in that place in the future, right? What's the problem? The same thing, folks, we've been seeing because of the live evolution, the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They not only have a hard time believing that there is a God, but one thing our world absolutely refuses to believe in is that, okay, if there is a God, he's not a God who judges. You're reading the wrong Bible because the Bible is very clear. God is a God who judges. He judges this planet once. He's going to do it again. And if you're not saved, you better get saved now. And therefore, to help these scoffing people hopefully become, with all due respect, smarter people, we're going to continue in our study, the witness of creation. And what we're doing is taking a look at all the different evidences that God's left behind for us, showing us this amazing truth. We really can have a personal, intimate, beautiful, loving relationship with God, the creator of the universe, right here and now, and not be afraid of having to face that judgment because Jesus Christ took it for us. Amen? It's all there for us. Now, he didn't just say that and leave us. He's given us tons and tons of evidence, and that's what we've been seeing. The first evidence showing us that truth was the evidence of an intelligent creation, intelligent design. We were not here by accident. God is the one who designed us. It's all throughout his creation, Romans chapter 1. Then we saw that uh, we have not been here for millions and billions of years, okay? Uh, we have only been here for a few thousand years with a young creation or young earth. The third one was the evidence of a special creation. Is anybody glad that you have a purpose in life? Right, and that purpose is to warn people of eating chicken. 
All right, that's my purpose. You got another one. But we all got a purpose, all right? But we all have the same purpose, is that God has created us. A special God has given us a special opportunity through Jesus, his special son, to have a special relationship with him. Isn't that much better than, hey, guess what? You came from nothing, you are nothing, and you go nowhere when you die. Get out of bed and be productive. Much better. And that's what the Bible talks about. Okay, the last eight times we saw the fourth evidence was the evidence of a judge creation. And that's been the theme. And what we've been seeing is God, hello, he not only judges his planet once, Uh, He's going to do it again. And we saw that the first time was with a worldwide flood, okay, is what we've been seeing. And that shows us that God, listen, takes sin seriously. He's going to judge it, okay? You can either have it be judged uh, through his son, Jesus Christ, and be forgiven of that, or try it on your own, which I don't recommend, okay? But God has judged this planet once because of sin. And we believe that not just because the Bible says so, not that that's bad, that's where we need to start, okay? But since we live in such a skeptical, scoffing society, we need to do our homework, Okay, and so we took a look at the evidence, and last time we saw the evidence of a glorious civilization, says so. And what we saw, if you recall, was the evidence of advanced technology, even ancient artifacts that are found all over the world that blows the theory of evolution once again out of the water. Contrary to what evolution would say, based on the evidence of what we find in the dirt, okay, there was never a time in the history of mankind when mankind was a bunch of dumb brute apes dragging their knuckles on the ground, hoping that fire, somebody could invent it really soon, let alone wheels, so they can get to Walmart. No, okay, there was never a time. The further you go back in mankind's histories, we saw that evidence mankind was super duper smart. That's what the scripture talks about. In Noah's day, they were super smart, highly advanced. In fact, we're only so advanced, folks, as we saw if you were here last week, so advanced that we don't even, we can't even duplicate what they've done in certain instances or certain things, even like electricity and batteries. We're just relearning right now, okay? But it agrees with the biblical account. It disagrees with evolution completely. But what do they do when they come across these things? Uh, It's an anomaly, which is the code word for hush it up, Bob, chuck it in a box and hide it. Right? That's what it is. So just because you can label it as a word like that, that doesn't mean that you explained it away. They don't. But it agrees with the biblical account. But that's not all. The third evidence that we really had a glorious high-tech civilization in the pre-flood world, just like the Bible presupposes and tells us, is the evidence of an amazing migration. Okay? Evolution would have you and I believe that mankind had its beginnings somewhere around the Mesopotamia area, and he was pretty much locked into that area generally, uh, and he did, really didn't branch out. And it's only until recently, in like 1492, that we had uh, people like Columbus even made it over here into the Americas. How I many guys would say that's probably not true? Hey, you scholars, you, yeah, it's not true at all. The Bible gives us, once again, a different picture. The people in the flood, pre flood world, carry that technology and that knowledge with them. Okay, and they had the ability to transverse back and forth across continents right after the flood. And we're going to see a ton of that evidence. But let's take a look at that Genesis account first. Genesis chapter 10 and uh, is our opening text, verse 21 through 32. Let's take a look at what God says happened after the flood. Okay, and what did these people do? Were they stuck in one area or did they kind of cruise around the planet? And then let's look at, at the evidence. Now, as you turn there, this is one of those passages that, uh, I don't know if it's a conspiracy or whatever, but you rarely ever hear preached on, okay? And as we we go through this tonight, I think it's going to be pretty obvious as to why it's very rare that you've ever heard, if you've ever heard, a sermon on Genesis chapter 10, the genealogies. But let's take a look at that passage there. Verse 21 uh, starts uh, uh, with this. He says this, uh, Sons were also born to Shem, whose older brother was Japheth. Now, Shem was the ancestor of all the sons of Eber. The sons of Shem uh, were this, Elam, Ashur, Arsphaxad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz, Hul, uh, Gether, and Meshach. Arsphaxad was the father of Shelah, and Shelah was the father of Eber. Now, two sons were born to Eber. One's name was Peleg, because in his time, the earth was divided. His brother was named Joktan. Joktan was the father of Almadad, uh, Shelef, Hazar, Merveth, uh, Jira, Hadaram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abimael, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Joab. That's why people don't want to preach on this. <laughs> Took me 27 times. I still kind of flubbed it up, but I tried my best. Okay, but anyway, that's my theory. Anyway, <laughs> all these were sons of Joktan, right? Keep reading. The region where they live uh, uh, stretched from uh, Misha towards Safar in the eastern hill country. These are the sons of Shem by their clans and languages and their territories and nations. These are the clans of who? Noah's sons, okay? Why is that important? Because who survived the flood? 
Noah and his family, his sons, right? According to their lines of descent within their nations. Now, here you go. From these nations, they were stuck in one area. For millions and millions of years. Oh, I'm sorry. So right after the flood, Noah's family, it says right here, they what? Spread out over the earth after the what? After the flood. So the Bible gives us, shocker, once again, a different picture than evolution would try to paint you and I. The Bible says that the descendants of Noah's sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, which is where all humanity comes from, by the way, okay, spread out over the earth after the flood. They did not say that they were stuck in a section of the earth. It didn't say a small portion of the earth. What did that text say? They spread out all over the earth, okay? That's what the scripture says, okay? And again, this is contrary to what evolution would say, that mankind was just a bunch of ape dragging their knuckles, stuck in this one area, and slowly as they evolved and spread out over the... No, okay? So obviously, we got two different accounts here. So when you do that, what do you do? Well, you call an anomaly and just move on. No, that's not how you... That's what they do, but that's not what we're going to do. We're going to put it to the test, and do we see any evidence that mankind had the ability to migrate across the planet early on, even as far back as shortly after the flood? Yeah. In fact, we find all kinds of things, folks, buried in the dirt. Evolution has no answer for. Only the biblical account gives us this ability. Mankind was super smart from the start. They carried that technology, even travel technology, with them. Let's take a look at some of that evidence. First of all, we see that in coins all over the world. Roman coins have been found in Venezuela, Maine, and even in Texas at the bottom of an Indian mound. You can't say that, well, it was just later, and you assume it was a long time ago. No, it's at the bottom of an Indian mound. Okay? How did Roman coins, I thought it wasn't until Columbus, unless, of course, people were traversing over the earth, and we've been told a lie. That's the tip of the iceberg. In 1957, a boy found a coin in Alabama that was from Syracuse on the island of Sicily, dating back to 490 B.C., now, because we all know that the Romans took their vacations in Alabama. Man, they got good gumbo. What? What is a Roman coin doing in Alabama? Okay, interesting. In the summer of 1882, a miner in British Columbia found 30 Chinese coins 25 feet below the surface that were older than 2000 BC. What? Chinese were in Canada over? Yeah, folks, they've been all over the earth, just like the Bible says. While sinking a fence to the depth of about two feet, a bronze coin was unearthed by this guy, Mr. Andrew Henderson, near Barron Falls, Australia, in 1910. The coin was positively identified as Egyptian, having been minted during the reign of Pharaoh Ptolemy IV around 200 BC in Australia. What is that? What? I, I, what? I thought we were still stuck in the area hoping fire would come. Yeah, we've been lied to. And Gordon uh, of Vale, Australia, a second bronze coin was dug up that was later identified as a Greek coin minted around 28 BC. You see, obviously, the proof is in the pudding. The Romans went to Alabama for vacation. Uh, the Egyptians and the Greeks went to Australia. What? Okay, let's continue on. How about pottery? Roman pottery has been unearthed in Mexico that, according to its style, is from about 2nd century AD. So even after the time of, of Jesus' first coming, they were still coming over here long before Columbus, folks. Okay, uh, it, uh, the inscriptions, the Kensington Stone, discovered in... John, you got it. Kensington, Minnesota, 1898, contains the inscription describing an expedition of the Norsemen into the interior of what is now known as North America. The problem is that it's estimated that this expedition took place in the 1300s. So even that's before uh, Columbus even arrived. Anybody starting to see a pattern here that somebody's not telling us the whole story about the history? of what's going on. Shocker. Uh, a fist-sized stone was found in Nashville, Tennessee in the early 1890s. The front was inscribed with Libyan symbols that were from about uh, pre-100 AD. And the inscription reads this, the colonists pledged to redeem. I'm not really sure what that means. Uh, that's what it's, it's translated. Okay. I don't know if they came over here and they got in a fight and they lost and were driven off. And we'll come back and get you. I pledged to come back. I don't know if that was their way of getting back. I'm going to put it on a rock. I don't know, but what is that doing over here? Near Rio de Janeiro, South America, high on a vertical rock, uh, 3,000 feet up is the inscription that reads this. This is what it says. Tyre, Phoenicia, uh, Banazir, firstborn of Jeth Baal, and is dated in the middle of the 9th century BC. So now they're going over to South America. 
Folks, none of this makes sense. None of this makes sense. Every, every single one of these, they, evolution would say, oh, uh, uh, anomaly, and then move on. You read Genesis chapter 10, if you can make it through those names. Oh, the Bible says mankind was going all over the earth right after the flood. That's why we have this. Okay, once again, it agrees with the biblical account. A mysterious rock inscription was found by a farmer in 1931, 50 miles west of Adelaide, Australia. The carvings were identified as, uh, as being Phoenician by French archaeologists and reads this, quote, men of the pharaoh of the city of Sais, Ot of Kish. Now, what's interesting, Kish was an ancient Babylonian town on the Euphrates and was the birthplace, we know from other records, of this guy named Ot. Ot, according to those records, was considered to be the greatest Babylonian mariner of the day. And apparently he lived up to his legend. He made it to Australia. Isn't that wild? Near uh, this place in Brazil, an inscription in Phoenician has uh, got these words, quote, We are the sons of Canaan from Sidon, the city of the king. Commerce has cast us on this distant shore. Okay, notice this is in Brazil. And the distant shore in the land of mountains. We set or literally sacrifice a youth for the exalted gods and goddesses in the 19th year of Hiram, our mighty king. We embarked from Ezean Geber into the Red Sea and voyaged with 10 ships. We were at sea together for two years around the land belonging to Ham or Africa. So they first went to Africa. Um, and then they were separated by a storm and we were no longer with our companions. So we have come here, 12 men and three women, on a shore which I, the admiral, control. Which I think is so out of place. Dude, you're lost. <laughs> but I am in control. I'm going to take this, whatever. It's a guy thing. Anyway, pictures. Listen to this. Uh, a botanist has identified, here's the picture, identified plants in an ancient fresco that has a pineapple and species of squash that are native only to the Americas. The problem is this fresco is in the Roman city of Pompeii. Oh, so when the Romans came over, the Romans, they also went back, and when they went back, they probably brought stuff with them that influenced well, again, that agrees with the biblical account. Evidence of ships, 1886, the remains of a shipwreck was found in Galveston Bay in Texas. Okay, the problem is the ship was constructed in typical Roman style. So after they went to Alabama, they came over to Texas for some, you know, Tex-Mex, grubbing salsa, right? Okay, but anyway, hey, north of uh, Cooktown, uh, strange aboriginal carvings have been found, okay, depicting ships not of European descent, but Egyptian descent, bearing the symbol of the Egyptian sun god. How did they know to draw a picture of an Egyptian ship unless, of course, an Egyptian ship was actually there? In Wollongong, Australia, there's a record of an ancient wooden ship that's similar to two others found in a swampland near Perth, and they're all believed to be Egyptian as well. Uh, evidence of artifacts. A doll was made of wood and wax, uh, was found in a, quote, well of sacrifice in... That just sounds evil. It's almost like chicken. Uh, it's go Mexico. And on this doll, though, was written a script in Roman. And it's at the bottom of a well. So how does it? Very interesting. In Uludula, Australia, was found a 2,000-year-old Chinese stone head that depicted a Chinese goddess. How did that get over there? 1910, people excavating uh, in a well near uh, Cairns, Australia, found an Egypt Egyptian scarab beetle six and a half feet below the surface. It was three and a half inches in length and had hieroglyphics carved all underneath. Sounds like that was a popular destination spot uh, in there. During the 1920s, uh, bushwalkers in the far north of Australia found a stone Peruvian idol. So you got people from South America going over there as well. Uh, Japanese steel blades have been found in Alaska, and their distinctive pottery is also found even in Ecuador. So you got those guys going from that direction as well. Uh, evidence of fossils. This is kind of cool. In 1982, archaeologists digging near this place, near this oasis in Egypt, uncovered fossils of kangaroos and other Australian marsupials. So just like the Roman frescoes, if they came over here, then they brought it back, and then that's what you see on both sides. If the Egyptians really were down in Australia that much, and they came back, they probably brought what? Kangaroos, and that's what they find. Very interesting. Evidence of languages. Ancient Chinese book was written about 338 BC. It mentions a great southern continent inhabited by fierce black people who used a strange weapon, which we now know as a boomerang. They were talk talking about the aboriginals. Okay, but how'd they know that back then? Evidence of statues. 1974, a 92-pound basalt rock was unearthed from a building in Australia while they were digging the foundations for a factory. The rock was carved with a solar motif, had stylistic uh, face there, hieroglyphs, and serpents. It was later identified as belonging to an ancient Mesoamerican culture at around 2000 BC, South America. 
So they've been going there for quite some time. Evidence of uh, statues. In 1914, an archaeologist was excavating a Mayan ruins in the city of wherever, Mexico. Uh, he discovered two statuettes that were clearly Egyptian. Okay, uh, One was male, one was female, complete with ancient Egyptian dress and engravings. Okay, And the Olmecs. This is kind of cool. I don't know if you guys have ever seen these, but this is uh, a quandary uh, for the evolutionists. Okay, the Olmec are thought to have been the first civilized people of South America around 1400 B.C., yet one of the mysteries they left are these giant carved heads wearing helmets. You can see a guy right there standing next to one. They're huge. That's how big they are. Okay, all are carved from a single piece of granite, and they're as tall as six feet, five inches high. They weigh more than 20 tons. The problem is the faces clearly depict African features. How would they know how to draw an African person unless they were over there uh, at that time? Okay. Yet historians tell us that Africans didn't come to the Americans until the time of Columbus. Stranger still are the numerous white people uh, features, European, that have also been unearthed there. You can see some different examples there. How do they know how to draw all that stuff? Very interesting. So the question is, what was an advanced black and even possibly white pre-Hispanic civilization doing in the Americas prior to and even more advanced than the Maya and the Aztecs? Okay. No one knows where they came from, where they went. They don't know how they move those huge stone uh, sculptures from distant quarries. Traditional, uh, traditional archaeology does not have the answers. Yet if you believe that man has always been advanced like the Bible says, you can easily see where they come from, right? In other words, only the biblical account agrees with all the evidence that we actually find. Shocker, God doesn't lie. One person said this, evolutionists want so much to show a steady, inevitable progression from caveman to advancing man. But Bible believers understand that man has been building what? Cities right from the start. And not just building cities, but they had the technology exactly like Genesis 10 said, that after the flood, they were going all over the earth. That's the only thing that explains this. Once again, the biblical account is true. So once again, that blows away the evolutionary mindset. The further you go back in history, the dumber man was. The more that he had hair on his knuckles and he was stooped over a dragon hoping fire would come along. That's a lie. That's a lie, not just on all the other stuff that we've seen with evolution and all its mechanisms that don't work. But what we find in the dirt does not agree with it either. But it does agree with the biblical account, okay? And so uh, that's what uh, we find, okay? But that's not all. The fourth evidence of a glorious high-tech pre-flood civilization is the underwater city. I couldn't wait to get to this one. This is awesome, okay? Because you might be thinking, you know, so far, we said, okay, Pastor Bill, over the last couple of weeks, we have saw that there was a pre-flood world. And it agrees with the Genesis account. These people were highly advanced, super duper smart, super intelligent. They had this technology that we can hardly even duplicate today or can't duplicate today. I, I, got, I got that one. And then we just saw that these post-flood people uh, carried that knowledge with them and they had the ability to traverse all over the planet. Okay, I get that one. But the worldwide flood was a global flood. And if there was a whole giant global civilization, including cities, the whole nine yards, you would think that we would be able to find, and it was submerged, uh, some evidence of their settlements. We already saw some artifacts in the previous study. They find some pottery, they find some gold jewelry and things of that nature and, and trinkets and bells. And so we find that. But you'd think they'd find some pieces of their cities or settlements. I said all that, John, to say what? We do. That's right. Give it up for John tonight. Uh, we find all kinds of stuff in the ocean. Watch this. This is really cool. Uh, in January 1967, the Illuminati, the world's deepest diving submarine at that time, uh, discovered an undersea road off the coast of where? Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. The road extended to depths of 3,000 feet, was paved by a layer of magnesium oxide. Arthur L. Market, the owner of the sub, reported that the currents kept the road swept clean so it looked just like a what? A blacktop road. In fact, so much so that they had actually attached wheels to the Illuminati and it rolled right along that road perfectly fine. One person stated this, what technology could build a long blacktop paved road for hundreds of miles that was still in good condition many thousand years later? Alien is what we saw that they'll, they'll say. <laughs> now, if you uh, agree, uh, believe in evolution, you're going to have to force to say that, okay, apparently they must have did this just before they invented fire. The apes dragging their knuckles. Maybe they had tar on their knuckles, Ron, and, and they were just going back and forth, and uh, over a million years, it created this road, and it was perfectly flat, and yeah, whatever, okay, obviously, it doesn't agree, but it agrees with the biblical account, okay, where'd that road come from? Is that a road left over from Noah's society? Hmm, 
interesting. That's not all. They also find him in the Atlantic. In 1966, during a research expedition, this guy, Robert uh, J. Menzies of Duke University, photographed what appeared to be rock columns under 6,000 feet of ocean. What are rock columns doing down there? In what's called the Milne Edward Deep. Uh, he admitted that the discovery of this may indeed be the ruins of an ancient city and very well could be, quote, one of the most exciting discoveries of this century. Some of the columns are half buried in mud while others are standing upright. Many of them appear to have some kind of writing on them. Why don't you show that on the History Channel? But that's not all. Another finding in the Atlantic was reported uh, by a salvage crew aboard this ship called the Talia from Spain. They videotaped miles of pillared, miles of pillared temples, buildings, and statues, and wide curving boulevards with smaller avenues branching out uh, from the center like spokes in a wheel. That's not a natural occurrence. How about in Cuba? Evidence of an ancient city was recently found a half mile down off the coast of Cuba, thanks to some Canadian and Cuban researchers. And they not only found structures like those at Stonehenge and Easter Island, but some of the structures were over 1,300 feet wide, over 130 feet high. Some of them are sitting on top of each other. They all show very distinct shapes and symmetrical designs of a non-natural kind. In fact, one of the anthropologists said that the still photos taken from the video show symbols and inscriptions, and it's not yet known what language the inscriptions are written in. And this caused one of the researchers to state this. Listen, it is stunning. What we see in our high-resolution sonar images are limitless rolling white sand plains, and in the middle of this beautiful white sand, <gasps> there are clear man-made large size architectural designs. And listen, it looks like when you fly over an urban development in a plane and you see highways, tunnels, and buildings. Except it's at the bottom of the ocean. I wonder how it got there. What starts to make you wonder about this whole legend of Atlantis. Maybe there's a lot more truth to that, except it's been minimized over the years. It wasn't just Atlantis, one city, if you will. It was the whole planet that got submerged. And maybe even that's where some of those legends come from. But this is what we find underneath. The problem is if the dating proves accurate, it means that an advanced ancient civilization had designed, erected these vast stone structures long before the wheel was invented in Sumeria and the sundial in Egypt. Okay, researchers also think that the city is much larger than what the projections show, and it may extend for even many more miles. Huge on the bottom of the ocean. But India, this is wild. Recently, there was an underwater find in India that, as they said, could rewrite history. Local fishermen in that area for centuries believed that a great flood consumed a city in a single day. But nobody believed them. Because, you know, those locals don't know nothing. You know, they, they haven't been to the universities to be brainwashed with evolution, so they don't know any better, right? Well, watch this. This guy, Graham Hancock, uh, secular guy, by the way, he took them serious, and so he and a team went out and checked it out, and what they found was extensive area of structures that were clearly man-made. In fact, the scale of the submerged ruins covers several square miles and are as spectacular, this is their words, as the ruined cities submerged off the Alexandria in Egypt. The problem is, if the dates hold true, it would totally upset previous archaeological opinion because they don't recognize any culture in India capable of building anything like this during that time. In other words, wait a second. At that time, man's supposed to be dragging his knuckles, still trying to create that asphalt highway back and forth from Florida, right? And it said this, there's a huge chronological problem in this discovery. It means that the whole model of the origins of civilization with which archaeologists have been working with will have to be, listen, remade from scratch. In other words, we've been lied to. They can, they can spout this all they want. Yeah, they got control of the media. Yeah, they keep putting these programs out. Yeah, they got control of the schools, but it doesn't line up with the fact. Oh, but guess what it does line up with? The Bible. That's right, Ruth. I saw that coming out of there. The Bible. Shocker. Okay, and that's why Hancock himself said, and this is a secular guy. He said, scientists should be more open-minded. I have argued, he said, for many years that the world's flood myths deserve to be taken what? Seriously, because that's where the evidence leads. A view, he says, that most Western academics reject, but here he says we have proved the myths right and the academics wrong. That's a secular researcher, by the way. And in Japan, one of the most amazing ones of a city that's completely submerged is off uh, there, the coast in Japan, uh, and uh, it's called Yonagumi, all right? So that's what you do when you tickle somebody in the armpit. No, it's the name of the city. I know you're thinking that. Okay, this one you have to see with your own eyes. You tell me if this is not man-made. What is this doing under the ocean? Let's take a look. 
the sapphire blue salt water of the East China Sea holds a bounty of natural wonders for those who come here. This undersea world has rarely been seen by people outside the tiny Japanese diving community that claims this part of the ocean for their own. In 1987, scuba instructor Kihachiro Aratake sets out to find ways to attract more divers to Yonaguni. But what Aratake discovers instead is even more unique, even more spectacular than anything he could have possibly imagined. When I first saw it, I had goosebumps and felt strange, wondering why something like this exists underwater. To Aratake, the stone megaliths he discovers look like the remnants of an ancient ceremonial structure. Masaaki Kimura is a professor of physical sciences at the University of the Ryukyus in Okinawa, Japan. In 1992, he is the first scientist to explore and measure the underwater phenomenon. The main structure is over 500 feet long, almost the length of two football fields, and taller than an eight-story building. To Kimura and his team, this is more than a collection of interesting rocks. Our studies show proof that the monument is not artificial, but is man-made. But Kimura's studies, published in Japanese and circulated only within his own academic community, fail to reach the West. Photographs are circulated on the World Wide Web where they attract the attention of Western divers. Among the first on the scene are husband and wife team Gary and Cecilia Hagland, underwater photographers who have made more than 9,000 dives around the world. The first time that we dove on the monument, it just seemed like I was in some sort of a science fiction movie flying across uh, some city, this massive, massive city. And when I got back up on the boat, I just, I, was, I had no words to describe it. The photographs of the monument also impress Graham Hancock, a former correspondent for The Economist and author of a series of books on Earth's oldest known structures. Hancock immediately takes a crash course in scuba diving so he can see the monument for himself. My first impressions when I first saw the main uh, underwater structure at, at uh, Yonaguni were of, of complete awe. To see very clean, almost right-angled, sharp edges, to see every appearance of design and uh, organization in a large stone structure underwater uh, ra raised in me a, a tremendous sense of excitement and mystery. The closest parallel, I would say, is the kind of feeling that, uh, that I get when I walk into a great cathedral or uh, into the great pyramid of, of, of Egypt. I was following Eritaki very closely as he pointed out the different features and he was motioning at his, at his eyes and then pointing to this perfectly carved out area in the rock. I, I thought he meant, come look at this, so I, I came in closer with the camera and I realized, oh, He's saying these are eyes, they're eyes. But I was so close I couldn't really see this. So as I, as I swam back with the camera, all of a sudden it just like materializes. There, carved in the side of this stage, is a perfect face. There's no doubt in my mind that this is man-made. There's just absolutely no way that this could just happen to be here. When I look at those faces, those brooding faces, uh, instead of Egypt, I think more of what you see in Central America, especially some of the, the Mayan uh, stone sculpture. And then along the side, another enormous image. It looked like some sort of a headdress or uh, bird wings coming off of the face, carved in the stone itself. And nobody that I know of has mentioned that to date. There are also niches in the rock that some believe could be petroglyphs. It really needs to be studied because there's more here than, than folks know. And I think this is going to just really rewrite the history books. To date, no such study is planned. According to experts, 
Around 8,000 B.C., we were primarily hunter-gatherers, nomadic, unorganized clans who had only the most rudimentary stone tools. Certainly not the kind of society capable of creating the Yonaguni monument. The question of considering a phenomenon like a series of submerged anomalous structures off the coast of a Japanese island uh, and, and the fact that very few academics have been prepared to spend even a minute of their time looking into that, to, to me this is a huge failure of science in, in, in the world today. It's very important to remember that there are a large number, large numbers of ancient traditions that refer to a lost civilization destroyed by a flood. But nobody seems to want to go over there and investigate. I wonder why. What does it agree with? The biblical account. Interesting. Looks to me, when you take a look at the evidence, folks, there really was a pre-flood civilization that was highly advanced. Uh, we find that technology buried in the dirt. Uh, we find their artifacts buried in the dirt. And we very well could be seeing some of their cities still unsubmerged underwater. Interesting. That's exactly what you'd expect to find if there really was a worldwide flood. How about you? Okay, but that's not all. If you thought that was uh, amazing, uh, not only does that agree with the Genesis account, but uh, Lord willing, next week, we're going to see that the Bible mentions something else very strange, uh, seemingly strange, uh, and that is the account of giants. Okay, the Bible clearly talks in the Genesis account that there were not only giants in Noah's day, but there were also giants afterwards. And so if we're going to put that to the test, uh, do you think we're going to find some giants that they're trying to cover up from us? Uh huh. Yep. Get ready for Herman, the 15 foot tall guy you want on your basketball team. Better call Kobe. Uh, we got some help coming, but that'll be next week. Let's go ahead and let's pray. Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and Get a Life Ministries, and I hope you enjoyed today's study. But in closing, before you go, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? You see, here's the problem. The Bible says that nobody automatically gets to go to heaven. And that's because God is holy and we are not. The Bible says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness or the wrong things that we have done have separated us from God. And the wages of our sin or unholiness uh, means that we deserve to die and receive God's judgment to go to hell and not heaven. In other words, we're disqualified for heaven. And that's because God being holy and us being not the two cannot mix. So what are we going to do? Well, that's bad enough. The other problem is we don't even want to admit this dilemma, even though God already knows it all. And so out of love, God gave us something called the Ten Commandments to show us that we're really disqualified for heaven. We're not holy. We're not perfect like him. Uh, let's take a, a look at just a few of those uh, here today. Uh, the Bible says, the Ten Commandments says, you shall not bear false witness. That means lying. How many of you have ever told a lie before? Well, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you just did. Okay, let's be honest, folks. Let's not tell another lie. We've all lied. Well, believe it or not, that disqualifies you for heaven. That's how holy God is. He is the truth. He does not lie. And so that makes us a liar. Another of the Ten Commandments says you shall not steal. Okay, how many have ever taken anything without permission? Well, all of our hands should have went up at that one. Uh, we've already said we're a bunch of liars. Okay, well, we've all done that. And it doesn't have to be a bank. Uh, it could be a pencil in the third grade. Uh, that means that we're a thief, okay? The Bible says that God is so holy, even his name is holy. And that's why one of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. Hey, folks, isn't it ironic how uh, now the blessed name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men might be saved, Jesus Christ, has now become a cuss word. Folks, the Bible says that's the sin of blasphemy. Okay? And folks, let's be honest. We've used God's name in vain uh, before. The Bible also says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus takes the standard even higher. He says, listen, it's not just physical adultery. He says, surely I tell you that if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. God looks at the heart. One more out of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not murder. And you might say, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? The Bible says that the sin of hatred is akin to the sin of murder. You, in other words, in your heart, wish they were dead. You pulled the trigger, if you will, in your own heart. And the Bible says God sees that 
and it's just as bad. He knows the mind, he knows the hearts, the thoughts, and the intents that we have. Folks, that's just five out of the Ten Commandments. How are you doing? Not very well. None of us can keep them. They're God's x-ray to show us that we're disqualified. And so when, not if, your time comes, because we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, you're going to have to stand before God. And you're going to have to uh, say who you really are. He already knows. Hey, God, let me into heaven. Uh, I'm, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer, adulterer, and a murderer. Folks, the Bible is clear. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's the problem. Here's the good news. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him, what he did on the cross, on our behalf, that we will not perish, we will not go to hell, but he will give us the gift of eternal life. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of all of our sins. It's something that we don't earn. We, we, we can't earn. It's a gift, the Bible calls it. And a gift cannot be earned. He was taking the death penalty in our place. That's what the cross was of the day. And that if we would just ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and believe that in our heart that God raised him from the grave, showing that his death is satisfactory to God to forgive us of all of our sins, no matter what we've done, the Bible says we shall be saved. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the grave, we will be saved. Let me give you a common analogy of what God's doing and what he did for us with Jesus dying on the cross on our behalf. Uh, in life, we know that people uh, can be sentenced for a crime uh, to where they're actually on death row. Uh, the courtroom scene has completely finished. The gavel has already sounded. Uh, they are going to jail and they're just awaiting their time before they go to the death penalty. Uh, as they're sitting there in the jail cell, uh, it, it's a proven fact they did what they did. Everybody knows it. They're just waiting for that time for their uh, number to come up, so to speak, and walk down that hall and be executed. Uh, there's nothing they could do to reverse their crime. No amount of good works in that jail cell can reverse what they've done. It's too late. It's over. But believe it or not, there's one way that people even today can get off a death row. And that's if the one in authority, the governor, if he were to, out of mercy and kindness, nothing that the person did, because they don't earn it and they don't deserve it, and they can't earn it, if he would grant them what's called a pardon, out of the kindness of his heart, he has the authority to grant them a pardon and absolve them completely of their crimes uh, against the state. And did you know that there's actually been people that this has happened to, that the governor, out of mercy, has granted them a pardon as a gift, and they've gone down to the jail cell and handed that person, extended it through the bars, here, I'm granting you a pardon. If you would just receive it, you can go free right now. And did you know that there's actually been people who've said, no, I don't want your pardon. And so what happened is of their own doing, even though they had a way out, they still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, can I tell you something? That's what God did for us with Jesus dying on the cross. He sent his son to take the death penalty in our place. He, God, has the authority to grant us through Jesus a complete pardon. And every day that you're still alive, God is extending to you spiritually this pardon. But a pardon does you no good unless you reach out and receive it by faith. Won't you do that today? Won't you call upon the name of Jesus Christ? Ask him to forgive you of all of your sins, to trust in his work on the cross, to pardon us from all of our crimes, our sins against God. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. But there's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. There's only one way to get off a death row. It's through the cross of Jesus Christ. Won't you do that? right now well this has been pastor billy crone of sunrise baptist church and and get a life ministries and if there's anything that we can do for you uh please don't hesitate uh to contact us uh our number our information will uh come up here on the screen shortly and uh, uh if there's anything we could do for you please don't hesitate to let us know uh thank you for uh joining us and uh remember i hope to see you in heaven god bless Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. 
If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.